And nothing beats enjoying a Badgers game with a Shermank hot dog. Shermank has been around for 90 years, making the right products with the right recipes put together by the right people. Wisconsin comfort food at its best. You'll find Shermank products at stores throughout Wisconsin and beyond. Visit Shermank on Facebook for your chance to win Badger basketball tickets. Keeping it authentic. Sure makes the difference. If you like powerful trucks and tractors, then the Watertown Lions 20th Annual Truck and Tractor Poll is for you at Badgerland Park County Road L and Silver Creek Road, Watertown. It happens Saturday, June 22nd at 2 p.m. Admission is just $10, under 12, free. There will be three mini rod classes from the Tri-County Pollers. The Badger Truck Pollers Association will also be there. Watch the Super Street Diesels, the Open Stock, and Super Stock. Competition from Super Farm Tractors, Light Limited, and and Pro Farm Tractors. Major sponsors for this event include Badgerland Roofing and Copeen Excavating. Food and beverage will be on site, no carry-ins. It's the 20th Annual Watertown Lions Truck and Tractor Poll, Saturday, June 22nd at 2 p.m. at Badgerland Park, County Road L and Silver Creek Road, Watertown. Affordable pricing for the whole family. $10 at the gate, children under 12 admitted free. See you Saturday, June 22nd at 2 p.m. at Badgerland Park, just north of Watertown. Napa know-how. Right now, get a five-quart jug of Napa conventional motor oil for just $11.99. That's a pretty unbelievable deal for a pretty unbelievable oil. But trust us, it's totally real, but only for a limited time. So get your five-quart jug of Napa conventional motor oil for only $11.99 today. Quality parts, helpful people. That's Napa know-how. Napa know-how. General states pricing. Sales prices do not include applicable state local taxes or recycling fees. Limit six per customer. Offer ends 6 30 19. Hey, welcome to this subway ad for the new club collection. How do you want it? I'll take a book club. Absolutely. So, last week we sunk our teeth into Subway's meaty new release, The State Club. Mm. Uh, oh, I didn't finish it yet. Oh, not again, Sandra. Uh, this week it's the new Southwest Chicken Club, also by Subway. No spoilers, but there's a tasty twist. <gasps> Jalapeno cheddar bread and guacamole? Sandra, get out. Subway, make it what you want. Mmm, good ending. Limited time only at participating restaurants. Now is the time to take a look around the house and inspect your windows. Call the folks at Hometown Glass and Improvement of Beaver Dam. The out-of-town, high-pressure window companies are traveling the country. Don't pay attention to their strong-arm sales pitch. Depend on the local guys that have a proven track record. That would be the folks at Hometown Glass and Improvement of Beaver Dam. The experts at Hometown Glass don't take shortcuts. They'll give you a free estimate and do the job when they say they'll do the job. In most cases, homeowners are very disappointed when they've done business with the out-of-town fly-by-nighters. Hometown Glass installs the window that's been around since 1947. That would be Lindsay Windows. The famous Lindsay Window will solve your cooling problem in the summer and provide a warmer house in the winter. Hometown Glass and Improvement, Highway 33 just east of Beaver Dam. On the web at hometownglass.com. Local sports, exciting interviews, special events, and cooking demonstrations are all on DailyDodge.com. Fast forward to the video page, sponsored by Kramer Wisconsin Cheese. 1237 from AM 1430 WBEV, streaming online at DailyDodge.com. It is time now for today's community comment. Here's your host, Craig Warmbold. Well, thank you very much, and good afternoon. Welcome to Community Comment. Our guest on Community Comment today is a state representative from Beaver Dam, Mark Bourne. Thank you very much for joining us today. Good to be here, as always. And a note to our uh, our listeners on AM 1430 WBEV, even those of you <laughs> listening to the audio stream at dailydodge.com. We are video streaming today's program, so if you'd like to uh, watch what we're doing, uh, feel free to uh, head over to the uh, video tab and you'll be able to watch that live uh, and you will be able to catch it after the uh, the program in uh, podcasted form as well. The phone number, if you've got a question, is 920-885-4446. That's 885-4446. If you've got a question for State Representative Mark Bourne, um, a, a member of the uh, the state legislature's Joint Finance Committee, and this is uh, this is really the legislature uh, has got the budget in the spotlight right now. I mean, this is uh, do or die time essentially. Well, maybe not do or die, but this so is uh, this is too dramatic <laughs> about it, but <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, but I mean, this is this is really uh, things are starting to come to a head, yeah. uh, if you will. Um, bring us up to speed as far as uh, where everything's at. Yeah, we finished the committee work last late last week. 
and um, now we've been uh, uh, working with uh, the fiscal bureau and the uh, drafting attorneys at reference bureau and 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 uh, kind of dotting all the i's and crossing all the t's i guess you could say to uh, uh, make sure that all of the action that we took in the last two months um, in the committee has been um, you know, put into the proper form for the bills to go before the assembly and the Senate next uh, next week. So um, we're um, really to the end of the committee process of being a joint finance committee member. Other than uh, continuing to do some things like this, where we're uh, doing some statewide media and stuff to help explain uh, what changes we've made and why we think they're important and things like that. Really, the committee work is done. On uh, next Tuesday, it'll go before the Wisconsin State Assembly. And uh, then uh, in a, the day or two after that before the Senate, and as long as things progress as, as we're expecting or planning through the uh, full sessions of the legislature, it'll be off to the governor for his uh, consideration. How confident are you that it's going to make its way through the assembly? We've heard a couple detractors already, uh, Republicans, saying that they, uh, they, they can't support it in its current form. A couple of senators have said that, yeah. So um, I'm very confident I'll go through the assembly on Tuesday. Uh, we had a great uh, full day caucus uh, yesterday, um, actually two days ago, Wednesday, and um, went through every you know detail really of the budget, made sure all members had a chance to ask their questions, get all the information that they wanted so that they were confident both in um, what was in the package as well as uh, their ability to explain it in their districts, much like I am here today. You know, you got to make sure we've got it all figured out and, and folks know exactly what's going on so that we can talk about it with our constituents. That's obviously a very important part of our job. And uh, so we had a good caucus on Wednesday. I think folks are um, you know, confident in what we've put together in this package. And so I'm very certain that it'll pass the assembly on Tuesday. I uh, also think that uh, in the days after that, it'll pass the Senate. And as you said, there have been a couple of senators that have made some public comments, but um, Senator Fitzgerald has been working closely as the leader of that caucus with the whole caucus. I know they were um, meeting every week as we moved along through the process, and I uh, had a couple more good caucuses this week. So uh, I think that uh, we're in the right place on the package, and uh, you know the votes will happen next week, and we'll know for sure, and then... It'll be the governor's turn to have his crack at it. And the senators who, who appear to be on the fence uh, say there's just too much spending in there. Do you agree mm -hmm. with that? Uh, I don't agree that there's too much spending based on the fact that uh, Tony Evers won. <laughs> I mean, this is the reality, folks. He is the governor of Wisconsin. Elections have consequences. And now we have to work with that governor. Um, and so we have to compromise on things. We have to include things in the budget that are things that he supported and wanted to see in there. Um, just like he has to accept that we're gonna, we took some things out. You know, it's a two-way street. And so um, just as he was elected, so was I and every other legislator that's there. And um, the folks uh, that chose in the last election chose divided government by choosing their reps and their senators and the governor. And so yeah, this isn't the package that we would have put together for a budget if Scott Walker was still governor. Um, this isn't what the budget would look like if you know, I was king for a day or if any of my colleagues on the Finance Committee were king for a day. It wouldn't look the same as the budget I would craft, but that's not the way our government works. Uh, we have uh, two uh, parts of the legislative branch that have to work together and get the votes that we need, uh, and that involves compromise. And then we have to put together a package that um, meets enough of the governor's goals that he'll also agree to sign the budget and uh, not carve it up too much with his powerful line and a veto pen. And so that's what a lot of what we tried to do. And so um, the spending's higher in some way, in some areas, than it was in the last budget. But I think that um, we invested in priorities. And the last election, whether you were running for governor or state legislature, was primarily about three issues roads health care, and education. Not necessarily in that order, and it could have been in any order, depending on what group you were talking to, but pretty much those three things were the things we talked about most consistently. And uh, those are all areas, which I mean, I'm sure we'll dive into some of it more, but those are all areas that have um, some major reforms, major investments, um, didn't do it all the way, exactly the same way the governor did it in all those areas, but I think we did things 
uh, in ways that made sense and made major investments and improvements in those areas. And um, that's what uh, we're going to spend uh, this summer. I think certainly I will spend that this summer talking to my constituents about that and focusing on what we're able to do there. And But is it all perfect? Is it all spending or things in the exactly the way I'd want it to be? No, that's not the way our process of government is, and, and, and that's fine. That's the way it works. We gotta talk about things, we gotta compromise, we gotta make deals, you gotta do the things you can do with the votes you have, and um, I'm confident that we put together a good package that invests in those priorities that we focused on um, in conversations with constituents and conversations on the road show, as we called it, as we toured the state and talked to folks. and. Um, this is the people's budget, um, and it's something that invests in people, um, not programs and not government. And so I think that that's something that um, I'm proud of. 920 4446 is the phone number if you've got a question or a comment for State Representative Mark Bourne. And uh, certainly we'll get into some of the specifics of the uh, budget here in uh, just a minute. You're welcome to, uh, you know, ask questions uh, that are budget related or if you've got a question about uh, general state politics or uh, other uh, laws that may be under consideration or feel free to uh, questions as well. Again, 920-885-4446. We'll go to the phones and say good afternoon. Welcome to Community Comment. Good afternoon. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Bourne, uh, first of all, you got to be proud of our local radio station here and uh, the great job they did over the past couple of days. Certainly. And uh, Thank I, you. I have three questions for you. I, I, what I'd like to throw them all at you. I've got a million more, but I, I'll <laughs> just ask three. You know, I'm going to have you guest host one of these uh, one of these days. <laughs> very much for those uh, those All questions. Right. Well, I was going to say, you're not going to have to do anything the rest I'm of the show, good. Craig. I'm going to go, uh, go have a cigarette <laughs> and I'll uh, come back in 20 minutes. <laughs> he covered the three main areas that I already <laughs> highlighted at, at the, you know, the, in my earlier comments of the three main areas that we focused on, certainly. I don't smoke, and by the way, I'd like to say uh, on the record officially. <laughs> <laughs> raised a bunch of questions in those, and so, I mean, I guess if if we want to just start working through some of those. You know, we should talk about roads because that yeah, is kind of okay. one of the big things that everybody's uh, been talking about a lot sure. lately. I know, uh, you know, uh, uh, we've heard uh, on our uh, newscast, for example, uh, uh, Robin Voss talking about um, that uh, the, um, the, the the gas tax would be higher uh, when when you take the average of what the yep. average Wisconsinite yep. spends on a gallon of gas. Yep. Uh, your position as well? Yeah, well, I mean, it's not about. That's really not about a position. That's just using data that's available mm -hmm. to us on what the average driver drives sure. and how often uh, the average person replaces a car. And obviously, this is average data. So, mm -hmm. as the caller said, 
Some people buy used cars and replace them every right. couple of years. They're going to pay that title fee more, and yeah. they, they're obviously driving the average in one direction. Then you have people that, um, kind of like myself, that tends to drive a vehicle until the very last breath and, and has them for 10, 12, 15 years, and I drive that average in the other direction. That's why the average person replaces a car in Wisconsin every five or six years. Mm -hmm. And so when you take that average person that replaces a car every five or six years, and then you take the miles driven, average miles driven is about 12,000 miles. Now again, I drive that, <laughs> I pull the average up because mm -hmm. I drive a lot more than 12,000 right. miles a year. But then you have other folks, you know, retired folks that might just be uh, going to church and then to the grocery store exactly. and, you know, they're driving the average down. So they're not the average. But when you looked at the data of the average Wisconsin driver and you take what that actually would be 10 cent gas increase because of the indexing the governor had in there, it was 8 cents and then it pulled a penny up more on the indexing each year. So at the end of the year of biennium, it was a 10 cent gas increase. And you take the increase that we put on the um, title fees and you, you add all those up, um, the average Wisconsin driver spends less on our increase to registration and titling than they would on that eight to 10 cent gas tax upper. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that's just the data on the average. Like I said, different people, different things. Sure. Um, so that's the thing with, you know, anytime you make a change like this, when you cut income taxes, you can say what's going to happen to the average person. When you cut uh, property taxes, you, they say what it's going to mean to the average home. I mean, you always hear those stories sure. when the school district sets their levy or mm -hmm. the or the uh, city hall does, you know, the average home, be a $100,000 home. Now I think the stories you see, the average home is yeah. well. you know, and how that impacts those things so everybody gets impacted differently than if you're not the average right but all we can do is look at the data that shows us what the average impact would be sure. and that's what that case was there and that's what uh, speaker voss was talking about and so yeah that's certainly true now that's not the only reason that we did what we did a lot of it is about what i said earlier about having to compromise and having mm -hmm. to work through these things and um there are certainly benefits to doing the gas tax that we don't get with doing the fees. But then there's some benefit to doing the fees, like the lower cost for the average driver, that we don't get with the gas tax. And so um, you just have to have these discussions and work through these things in the caucuses. And I mean, I've said before on this show, um, certainly during the campaign, I talked about it a lot. I was fine with a modest gas tax increase. I was mm -hmm. fine with doing what the caller suggested. Mm -hmm. oh, I was thinking, yep. you know, three, four cents, you know, get some more money into the system. I wasn't where the governor was, but I was always saying, you know, I, n I actually never put a number on it in the past, but right. I was always saying, you know, yeah, we could do a modest gas tax increase. Now, that's not a long-term solution. We've talked about that before, right. you know, with all this focus on electrics and hybrids and, and the fact that companies like Amazon are focusing on that for the future of deliveries and things, all kinds of stuff you know these aren't but a short-term solution a modest increase would have been fine um, that's not where the votes were that's not ultimately where the caucuses were so um, as we spent the basically this I mean my office we worked on this transportation package basically this whole year so for right. five months um, we've worked on this and um, there were a lot of different things that you know you kind of throw go into caucus and make a presentation and, and throw stuff on the wall and see okay. what sticks. We had a lot of different, um, what the Fiscal Bureau would call revenue uppers. <laughs> mm. Different things that you could increase or charge differently or transfer or whatever to bring more money into the system. And ultimately what we settled on were um, the title fee increase and the registration fee increase. And yeah, the title fee is a is a, you know, about a doubling of it roughly, a little bit more than that. Um, but again, the average person, if you're doing that every five or six years, you know, it's a, what, 15 buck upper over the a year, over the you know, lifespan of that. And the caller's right, it'll hit different folks differently depending on how you buy your cars and where you buy them and stuff, and that's, that's for sure. And then the registration fee was a $10 increase. I, don't, I haven't had too many people saying that they think that's unreasonable. Uh, what was it, 75 to $85 sure. to renew your license place? You know, I mean, some folks don't want to see any uppers. I get it. You know, don't want to see any fee increase, any tax increase. The fact is, is that the things that we've heard the most in the last couple of years is fix the roads. Yeah. 
And if we're going to do that, we have a user fee based system that transportation fund now constitutionally protected of some several years ago. Can't be raided anymore like Jim Doyle did when he was governor to use the money in different places. So the money goes for roads. Um, we needed to bring some new revenue into that system. So we raised these fees, brought about 400 million new revenue into the system. And um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways you could have do, done it. You could have, you know, focused on pushing tolling faster. You could have focused on uh, some sort of vehicle miles traveled fee faster. Those would be more long-term solutions, but folks aren't ready for that yet. There's a lot of angst about that. That we need more study. We need more information. You know, we need. Uh, ultimately, we're going to have to move towards something like that because the gas tax isn't going to last forever. And in 10, 15 years, when more people are driving electric cars, this will be a major problem. So we got to tackle it down the road. That's part of why we put the study in there to say, all right, let's do the second phase of the study on VMT, which would either be some sort of mileage-based fee or tolling. Either one of those would are mileage options. Mileage-based fees, huh? Yeah, well, and that's, let's get some more information. We're not yeah. putting any of it in place now. What I'm saying is we're going to need a long-term solution at some point. Sure. And I've personally been more of an advocate for tolling. We've talked yeah. about that before. So on right. the arrow, and for several years already, we've talked about that. Um, but some folks really hate that. All these things, like sure. the fees that we did have negatives, the gas tax has negatives. Right. They also have positives of bringing new revenue into the system, and some of them don't. I mean, like adding to these fees, we didn't have to do anything new as far as like new staff or a new program or, you know, add cost to the right. system. We just up the fees a little bit and bring a little more money in, and we can fix more roads then. And I think that's, I mean, so far we've only been focused on how much more money we're taking from you and how we're doing it. I mean, what we do with this then is make some major investments and the mo majority of it in our budget, um, we matched everything for state roads and uh, bridges and, and things of that in the governor's budget. But then the extra money that we brought in, we focused on local roads. Um, we matched his 10% increase on local road aids and then we more than tripled the investment on a program that's called, referred to as LRIP, uh, the Local Road Improvement Program. I actually talked with Mayor Gluen about this a week ago already and said, um, you know, make sure you've got your staff working on this because this is a, you know, a major investment. And so if Beaver Dam can, you know, take advantage of this grant in some way. And so I'm sure she's got, uh, you know, folks at, at City Hall already looking at so what how we, we can... I, I didn't mean to interrupt yep. you, but what are we talking about? And, uh, you know, you sat on the council in Beaver Dam, you mm -hmm. know how tight dollars are. And yeah. just generally speaking, as a member of the legislature, you know how much construction costs are for new road yes. reconstruction. I mean, are, are we talking about six digits, five digits, well, we seven put, digits we put, for locals? We put $90 million of new money into this LRIP program. Now, it's a competitive grant program, so there's no guarantee that any particular community will get any of it. It's They're going to have to apply. Mm -hmm. And the program, though, was currently funded at uh, 32 or 33 million. Yeah. We kept the current funding and then put another 90 million on top of that. So um, this is a huge increase in this program. And it's a program that's for specifically for road reconstruction. It's not for crack filling. It's not for new roads. So you can't use, you can't apply for it to like build a new subdivision or something like that. It's for like the type of stuff she's trying to work on right now on South Spring Street. Mm -hmm. um, it's for roads like Madison Street, which are terrible to drive through some sections of that right now. Right. And I mean, and, and other communities all throughout Wisconsin are going to compete for the same stuff. So there's no guarantee that Beaver Dam will get any of it. But that's part of why I wanted to highlight it to her um, is hopefully the governor won't change this and line on veto or anything and he'll sign the bill. And then, you know, later this year, communities will be applying for that. And I wanted to make sure Beaver Dam had it on their radar and, and started to look at it because um, the other important thing about it is the current program at, that's funded at 30 is a 50-50 split. Mm -hmm. and, um, we changed the formula to a 90-10 split. So um, that's why, you know, if people go with road projects and have things on the shelf, as they say in the business, that the road is planned and ready to go, and you apply for and get this grant, you know, the local money will go a lot farther with only having to pay 10% of the project. Mm -hmm. Um, but it also means the competitive grant, even with all the new money we put in, will go that much faster. So, you know, it's all, it, we'll see how it works, but we kind of wanted to see what the demand was. And, you know, we knew we could get a dent in it 
in local roads and then if it's a really successful program maybe we'll try to expand it next time it's too certain to tell what the next budget will look like and what funds will be available but we kind of looked at this as like all right we're hearing a lot about the need for money in local roads here's a way where we can throw a bunch of money into a program that already exists again not having to create a new program make it an even larger portion of it state invested and you know see what kind of dent we can put in it and see what kind of interest there is in, in it moving forward so i want to be respectful to our first caller we're definitely going to get to those uh, other two questions that mm -hmm. you asked but I, I do also want to make time before the break for a caller that we've got hanging on right now at 920-885-4446 we'll go to the phones and say good afternoon welcome to community comment hi you're on the air i know you've been waiting for a while but uh this uh if uh, you were Hanging on the line, now's your chance. All right, well, we'll uh, uh, while we're waiting for that to sort out, you know, I've got to say the one thing that I've heard the most is, uh, and maybe it's because I'm from Illinois, mm -hmm. it's uh, that with this uh, you know, lack of gas tax uh, being part of it, uh, that Illinois <laughs> drivers oh, yeah. aren't being hit, that Minnesota, yeah. U UP, I mean, obviously the, 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 the folks around us that do, there is no buy-in from people from other states that use our roads. Yeah, and that's certainly been the talking point from the opposition to our plan. And um, certainly, as I said, all this stuff has negatives, and that's one of the negatives of the fee increases is that it doesn't um, capture some of the out-of-state money. Well, one of the things I think that is important to remember as I've been listening to some of that commentary, we didn't get rid of the gas tax. Mm -hmm. right. we, didn't, we didn't reduce it. We still have one of the lar one of the higher gas taxes in the Midwest. So, you know, when all those Illinois visitors right now are coming to their northern Wisconsin uh, escape places that they like to go to, and we appreciate them doing that, tourism is an important part of the Wisconsin economy, but as we are seeing all of them drive through southern Wisconsin on their way up north and they stop for gas, they're still paying the, the gas tax. And so um, we shouldn't pretend like somehow that's vanished. It's Yes, we did not increase their gas tax. That's mm -hmm. true. Right. And that was one option that was discussed. It just wasn't the one that ultimately uh, won out in the, in the negotiations. But um, we shouldn't pretend that they're not paying still gas tax. They're not paying sales tax when they go in and or that you know get that slurpee and those m ms and stuff for the, for the rest of the ride and then you know whatever so certainly tourism is an important part and we're glad that folks are investing and, and, and yes that's that's certainly one of the knocks on not doing a gas tax increase i think we have that caller lined up and we should be able to get him in before the break and say good afternoon welcome to community comment hello hi you're on the air yeah on the road issue uh how much are the fees and licenses being raised for the trucking industry mm, good question so mm -hmm. trucking industry specific i think yep. we've been talking a lot about you yep. know, typical residential consumer level yep. cars ten dollars yep. for that yep. i'm asking about the trucking industry right yep um so for on um, trucks over ten thousand pounds there were no increases put into this budget because they already pay fees in the midwest here in wisconsin uh, we're the second highest in the, I can't remember if it was seven or nine state region that was looked at on that. So um, the governor did have a big 27% increase for him, them in his budget, and uh, we elected to continue that. Um, as I said, they're already the second highest in the region. And we also, um, in light trucks, so the, thi the trucks, um, under used to be under eight thousand, I think, in the change we made, it's ten thousand now. Um, there used to be different. Um, I think it was lettered classes. Um, was something that was pretty confusing for folks. I think a lot of people never really had their pickups and larger vans and stuff necessarily titled in the right license plate for their truck size anyway. So we consolidated all of those into one. Um, so now there will be. Uh, your car licensing, your light truck, so under 10,000, and then um, the stuff above 10 is where all the other, uh, they've got much greater uh, fees and, and things that, that come into play for them. Well, uh, they deserve to have higher fees. Right. If you check with the transportation department, on uh, 18 wheeler does as much damage as about 7,000 cars. Yep. And I think you're subsidizing the trucking industry. You should reconsider what you're doing. 
Okay, well, thanks for your thoughts. I mean, it's like I said, they already pay a lot more. Um, they pay about, depending on what study, somewhere between 52 and 55 percent of the uh, cost now. Um, of course, uh, with the uh, gas tax or diesel taxes, they those trucks use a lot more fuel, so they pay a lot more into that system. And so that's certainly, I mean, we weighed all that in our discussions, certainly. And y he's right, the caller's right, that they should pay more because they do have a greater impact on the road. I would just say that um, we think they are paying more. Um, they're paying uh, more than what uh, trucks pay in more states, and they're paying uh, the majority of the fees that are collected in the system here in Wisconsin. And so that's why you know, the decision was made the way it was. That considering the amount of damage they do, you should go to the gas tax. And I think it would be fair to the the uh, person or the, with the car or light truck. You're taxing them in order to subsidize the trucking industry. It's my view. Okay. okay. Well, thanks for the call. We do appreciate that yeah. uh, call at 920-885-4446. Our guest is State Representative Mark Bourne of Beaverdam. Uh, if you've got a question or a comment after the uh, break, we'll be more than happy to take that phone call again. 885-4446, back in a few minutes. WBEV Beaver Dam, streaming live at Daily Dodge, brought to you by Beaver Dam Piggly Wiggly. Time for new tires? Pull into the Quick Lane service at Countryside Ford in Columbus. No appointment necessary. Get the price match guarantee? Countryside Ford, 330 Transit Road in Columbus. It's a primal thing, the need to conquer fire and contain it in kettle-shaped vessels, cooking hot dogs and burgers to juicy perfection. You want to be king of the grill. Cool tools and secret sauces are great, but once you've mastered the basics, it's all about the bun. So the Bakers and Village Hearth Buns bow to you, grill king, by offering buns worthy of your meats. Whether the perfect pairing is a classic white or wheat bun or light Italian with sesame seeds, it's got to be Village Hearth. Village Hearth Buns, baking our best for you. What's it like to see the world after years of cataracts? For Jenny, her visit to Vita Park Eye Associates was life-changing. Oh my gosh, there, there are no words to explain. Even when I had the cataract removed on the first eye, things in my house were bright and colorful. I went to the grocery store. Everything was so bright and colorful and clear. Oh, there are no words to describe. Oh, I would definitely recommend Vita Park Associates and Beaver Dam. They explain everything in detail. They let me know if my eyes were uh, suitable for this kind of surgery or not. We're very honest and forthcoming, and I had time to decide if I wanted to or not and so on. Oh, I, I would recommend them to anybody that had any eye issues. Visit VitaParkEye.com and see how your eyes can seriously improve with age. Partially covered by Medicare, results may vary. You remember the story of the guy who didn't have any nuts to give the squirrel, and the squirrel says, no sweat, you can give them to me later. I'll live on thatch. Think of Surefire as the squirrel, and you need a terrific, energy-efficient Lennox home comfort system now. But you're short of nuts. No biggie. Surefire is up to $2,075 in Lennox and Focus on Energy rebates, or 60 months low interest financing. Get the Lennox now, and Surefire will collect the nuts later. Call Surefire, your local Lennox premier dealer, online at Surefire Inc. Com. You'd be nuts not to. Hey, I just used a metamorphosis. You're probably wondering why I speak so good. That's from years of working on my electrocution. See you later. Call Surefire. Purchase by June 30th and be eligible for up to an additional $500 instant cash back rebate. Be sure with Surefire. Columbus Community Hospital. Well into the future. Need a hip replacement? The average stay of Columbus Community Hospital is 1.8 days. Columbus Community Hospital, building a caring relationship, one patient at a time. Well, Daryl did it again at Beaver Dam Piggly Wiggly on the beautiful east side of Beaver Dam. He just bought huge deals on Kessler's, Captain Morgan, Corbell Brandy, and Fleischmann's Vodka, and that means you're going to save big. While you're there in the liquor department, remember to check out new low prices on Mr. Boston products, including Mr. Boston Vodka, Brandy, and Gin, and the popular Stella Rosa wines in the 750 milliliter size are just $9.99. Check out the savings in the liquor department at Beaver Dam Piggly Wiggly on the beautiful east side of Beaver Dam. 
25% off select Ram Bighorn Crew Cabs during the Ram Bigger Things sales event at Reed Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram and Beaver Dam. That's more than $14,000 off the 2019 Motor Trend Truck of the Year. Hello, this is Brent Reed, and the deals don't stop there. For you minivan drivers, how about 0% financing for 60 months plus $5,700 off brand new Chrysler Pacificas while supplies last? Let our family take care of your family at Reed Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram and Beaver Dam and ReedChrysler.com. See the latest local obituaries online at dailydodge.com. Brought to you by Lidkey Motors. 108 from AM 1430 WBEV. Streaming online at dailydodge.com. Time now for more of today's community comments. Here we're going to see your host, Craig Warmbold. And our guest is State Representative Mark Bourne of Beaver Dam. The phone number, if you've got a question or a comment, is 920-885-4446. And a uh, note to our uh, listeners out there, uh, we are video streaming today's program. If uh, you want to check it out at uh, dailydodge.com, you just go under the video tab, and you'll be able to find it there. You'll also be able to find it after the program as well. A uh, couple uh, questions, uh, topic areas that we still want to make sure that we address. And um, let's go to um, the, the first caller's uh, s uh, statements about the, uh, the governor and his, and his expertise in education. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, this, is, this has been his lifelong career path, uh, and certainly he brings a unique perspective when sure. it comes to education. Um, I is there a little bit more, should there be a little bit more willingness to, uh, to compromise with the governor on some of his education ideas? Yeah, and here's one where I think, again, we did, and that's why spending's higher than it probably would have been, and um, we matched exactly his per-pupil um, amount of 200 in the first year and 204 in the second year, and uh, we made uh, additional investments. We doubled the amount of uh, the grants in mental health. We created two grant programs in the last budget, and uh, we doubled uh, the amounts uh, in those. I think it was another $12 million dollars. And then we made a major investment in special education, and this is really where the major difference is. You know, his was much higher, um, but we put $94 million in, which is nothing to sneeze at, um, took it up to about 30% uh, reimbursement. Uh, he certainly was trying to go much higher than that, but that's the thing. I mean, compromise isn't like accepting the whole thing, you know. Um, so I think that we made uh, major investments in, in important areas there, and we matched them on the per people. And another thing to mention on special education, is the last two budgets that he submitted as DPI superintendent, including what he submitted last fall for this budget before he was governor, was to move it up to 30% reimbursement. And that's exactly what we did. It's when he became governor that suddenly he wanted $600 million of new money in the special education. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a major increase. I don't think what he proposed was realistic. And so, um, yeah, we spent less, but we still made a major investment. We're still at record levels of funding through K-12 K through education, and that's because it is important. It's one of those three things we talked about at the beginning of the show today. It's what we've been talking to constituents about. Uh, we made a major investment in the last budget. We made a major investment again this budget. Um, the greatest investment we made in any area, again, for two consecutive budgets, K-12. through um, We're spending... It's, it's got to be over 12, probably $13 billion in this budget on K-12 through education. Um, so it's a significant investment. I think it's the right compromise. And so I would argue that we did compromise with him on this. Um, like I said, compromise isn't giving him everything he wanted, especially when he's asking for more than a billion dollars in new money, and that's something that's never been done. I don't think as I talk to superintendents and stuff in my area, I always meet with them all um, every budget cycle. I also try to regularly attend a monthly meeting that CESA 6 puts on up in Oshkosh with area superintendents. And I don't think any of them thought that was a realistic number when the governor put it out. They just liked that he was, you know, pushing the envelope to get new money into the system and wanted to, ma you know, make investments. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, last Friday, I was at um, that meeting at CESA 6. They're all very pleased. Um, I got a number of contacts from local superintendents that were very pleased with the investment we've made. Um, so I think that uh, this is another good, important investment, and, and it is a compromise, I view it as. What about teacher compensation at the university level? We um, gave state employees another raise in this budget, 2%, 2% across the board at two different points in the budget, and the university system continues to have uh, merit 
pay ability so they can uh, focus on uh, trying to retain uh, top teachers and um, you know the again the Board of Regents I think we're hoping for a 3% 3% and they got a 2% 2% so I mean uh, you don't always get uh, everything you ask for but I certainly think that it's uh, another area that we're making a major investment in um, we didn't spend as much in the UW system as the governor did but between the raises and other funds uh, for programming and stuff we're uh, pushing 100 million, I want to say 94 million, 96 million, something like that. So um, another, I think, significant investment on top of what we did last budget. Uh, the, uh, the caller had asked about health care as well and, and put out the idea of really tabling anything uh, related to major changes in health care mm -hmm. until after the, uh, the November 2020 election. Mm -hmm. um, your thoughts? Yeah, I think that I mean, he makes a good point because certainly what happens at the federal level is what drives a lot of this health care discussion, you know, whether or not the funding is going to be there to expand welfare programs, um, what, uh, whether or not uh, uh, Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act will continue in its current form and what those subsidies will look like, um, how much costs will continue to climb, uh, because a lot of that stuff is much more affected by what happens excuse me, happens at the federal level than uh, at the state level. But there are still some things that we can do, and so that's why, um, you know, we had areas where we made major investments in this budget, and I don't think um, most of what we did would be, we would do differently necessarily based on changes at the federal level. Um, we put more money into the dish payments for the dis uh, for hospitals that have high uh, Medicaid uh, uh, use, um, it's important for maintaining rural hospitals and helping them with their costs. We put significant more in, into uh, nursing homes, assisted living, uh, direct care workers. This is something that we invested in last budget also and uh, did uh, a lot more investment than the governor did um, in this area in our budget because it's something that, again, uh, on, the, on the road show or talking with homes and our nursing homes and, and uh, home care workers and stuff in the district, it's a real priority. Um, more folks uh, retiring and going into this sort of uh, uh, need for this area in our, in our aging populations and fewer workers and having a harder time filling the worker vacancies because of low wages in some parts of this industry. So it's something that we've really focused on. And so some of those healthcare investments I think would happen most likely regardless of what the federal situation was. Um, and here again, um, the main difference with the governor was we didn't expand uh, government funded welfare for health insurance and instead continued to do um, have more people covered than other states do by what we did several years ago to make sure that everyone below poverty is covered by the the Badger Care Medicaid welfare program and other folks have um, the availability of the federal program um, and the subsidized insurance and that has led to much better coverage as a percentage in Wisconsin than you see in other states. And we still then were able to take our general fund investments in things like the dish payment that I talked about in the nursing homes, the direct care, and get the federal matches that the governor is always talking about. So when we put um, some money into nursing homes, and I don't remember all the money off the top of my head, but I think the nursing home one was like 47 million, 40 some million in GPR. Then that brings in a federal match that actually ends up being over a $90 million investment in the nursing homes with the federal money that comes on top of that. And all of those other areas I talked about all have federal matches too. And so, um, you know, we continue, and this isn't something new. This is stuff that we've been doing for a long time. These federal programs have been around for a while. So this is bringing in this federal money isn't some new magic or anything. It's just that's what we do. We focus on um, areas that are a priority. We invest some of our state funds into it. We get federal matching funds, and that's what makes um, all these programs uh, work at the level that they do. And so I think while the caller's right that what happens in Washington, D.C., 
has a much greater impact on health care costs and health insurance and coverage and stuff overall than what we can do at the state. There's still areas in the state where we can have some uh, major impact, like investing in some of these priorities and things. And so um, that's all stuff that uh, we build off of our successes from the last couple budgets and, and continue to invest in. Uh, the governor's got uh, one of the uh, most powerful veto pens in the uh, the nation. How uh, how cognizant of that are legislators, Republican legislators in this case? Uh, how much of that is a uh, a factor when you're when you're crafting the wording that mm -hmm. goes into this budget? It's a major factor. We spent more time on that than we did almost anything. It seemed like um, in our offices, we were very focused on that. Um, that's why you don't see a lot of new programs in this budget because new programs require new language to create and define those programs. And um, that's not something that uh, we can do if, if we don't have a willing partner. Now, hopefully at some point, Governor Evers will be more willing to work with us on these sorts of things, but this budget, he wasn't really willing to negotiate on stuff, um, didn't really have much of a relationship negotiating with the leaders in the Assembly or the Senate. Um, hopefully that will change with time but that's not where we were here. So, um, I mean, all you have to do is look at the fact that um, Wednesday, the draft of the substitute amendment that will become the budget um, was uh, made available and uh, we started working through it to check for errors and, and veto concerns and things. And uh, it's a little over 500 pages. Uh, as comparison, the last budget, the first budget that I worked on the Joint Finance Committee was a little over 1,300 pages. So it's got a lot less words. We put a lot less in it. I mean, we just, it's more about appropriations and ongoing appropriations and changing the numbers and um, because that's what divided government brings you, and especially when um, there hasn't been a lot of dialogue. I mean, maybe if there was more dialogue for trade-offs and deals and things, that could have been different, but that's not where we are right now. So uh, we crafted a budget that invested in priorities, focused more on using current programs and current systems to do it, and uh, you know, we'll see if that changes down the road. 920-885-4446 is the phone number if you've got a question or a comment for State Representative Mark Bourne, uh, whether it be on the uh, the state budget or any of the bills that may be uh, passing their way through the legislature, or you've got a question about something that's already on the books. 920-885-4446. We'll be happy to take those uh, calls after the break when we return on Community Comment. The strawberry season is here. Strawberries are ready at Kirschbaum Strawberry Acres on Highway 151 between Beaver Dam and Columbus. Pick your own or buy already picked. It's a bumper crop of strawberries at Kirschbaum Strawberry Acres between Beaverdam and Columbus on Highway 151, open 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. every day. You do it right to save because you work too hard for your money not to. Lowe's is here to help with July 4th savings throughout the store, like $15 off gallon cans and $45 off five gallon pails via Lowe's gift card rebate when you buy select interior and exterior paint and stain. Update your appliances and get up to 40% off select appliance special values. Like a Whirlpool refrigerator was $13.99, just $9.99. This July 4th, do it right for less. Start with Lowe's. Offers valid through 710 while supplies last U.S. only. Not a big summer guy. Too hot. Not a big winter guy either. Too cold. My favorite season? Safety season. Because it's every season. 24-7, 365. For all things safety, I trust Granger. Granger's safety experts have the safety solutions and expertise to help keep your facility safe and your people safer all year long. Seasons may change, but Granger's always got your back. Call clickgranger.com or stop by for all things safety. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Come enjoy the Tony Award winning Broadway musical Newsies at the Beaver Dam Area Community Theater. This summer's high school age musical brought over 60 talented students from 14 area high schools together to bring the rousing tale of Jack Kelly set in turn of the century New York City to life. This Broadway musical is based on the 1992 motion picture and inspired by the true story of the Newsboy Strike. Take a trip back in time and tap your toes along to the show-stopping musical numbers. Show dates are June 20th, 22nd, 27th, and 29th at 7.30 p.m. Matinee performance on Sunday, June 23rd and 30th at 2 p.m. Tickets can be purchased online at BDACT.org or at ReachX Food Pride or at the BDACT Fine Arts Center on Tuesday and Thursday from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. 
Student Rush tickets may be purchased for $8, 30 minutes before the show begins. Come watch this extremely talented group of young actors as they sing and dance the night away. Newsies at the Beaver Dam Area Community Theater. From tending the garden to kicking back in the yard, Fleet Farm has what you need for the weekend. Whether it's game nights moving outside season, or who says yard work can't be fun season, you'll save at our 4th of July sale on things like shredded covered mulch, five bags for $10, and kings for charcoal, two packs for just $9.99. There's a reason people say, if Fleet Farm doesn't have it, you don't need it. Fleet Farm, built for real life. High quality, compassionate primary care close to home is the cornerstone of your family's health and wellness. BDSH Medical Clinics in Beaverdam, Coracon, Juno, and Wapan are here to support you along your personal journey of wellness. Experienced physicians and talented advanced practitioners work with you to prevent illness and disease and care for your health concerns. Learn more about BDCH Medical Clinics close to you. Visit bdchbackslashclinics.com or call 920-887-7181. What's in store this week at Staples? Savings, boxed up and ready to move. If you're on the move, make sure your first stop is Staples. Because right now, when you spend $50 or more on moving supplies at Staples, you save $10. Staples has everything to get you from here to there, like boxes, bubble roll, and packing tape. So before you go anywhere, stop at Staples for big savings. Savings on moving supplies. Staples. Where there's a whole lot in store. And 629.19. In store only. Exclusion supply. See associate for details. Listen to WBEV online anytime at dailydodge.com. Brought to you by Beaver Dam Piggly Wiggly. 124 from AM 1430. WBEV streaming online at dailydodge.com. Time for more of today's community comments. Here again is your host, Craig Warmbold. And our guest, State Representative Mark Bourne of Beaver Dam. The phone number, if you've got a question, is 920-885-4446. Again, streaming at uh, dailydodge.com and audio and video today. If you want to watch the program, just go to the video tab at dailydodge.com. A call off break uh, from a listener asking about um, uh, whether or not your caucus, uh, the GOP, is, uh, is eyeing anybody up, is looking at anybody for the uh, governor's race here in the early goings uh, for 2022. Well, I'm certainly not prepared to announce here yet today, Craig. <laughs> but no, I mean, no, it certainly won't be me. Um, but uh, certainly, there are you know we have great candidates, great leaders in in the party that will be um, strong candidates if they decide to do that. I don't know if it's really that we're eyeing people up yet necessarily. I mean, there's some that I think are you know logical um, to assume would be potential candidates. Um, some of our congressional delegation perhaps uh senator johnson uh, obviously is our as our one statewide elected republican right now um rebecca clayfish was a great lieutenant governor for eight years so certainly she would be a strong candidate um, there's certainly leaders in the assembly in the senate you know senator fitzgerald and, and speaker voss are great leaders in, in the legislature whether or not they would decide to do that there's um, I'm not concerned at all about um, potential candidates because I think we have a really deep bench there, um, but uh, not something that's discussed in any detail right now. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, w uh, and you guys are in uh, uh, meeting in Madison uh, a couple times a week now, moving mm -hmm. bills. Uh, uh, one of the bills that advanced out of the assembly on Tuesday was uh, related to uh, step therapy for mm -hmm. uh, prescription drugs. Basically. Uh, what the insurance company says you have to take before you're allowed to take what your doctor wants you to take. Right. Uh, wh wh where are we at with this? What does the bill do to address um, concerns that some people may have when it comes to that? Yeah, the step therapy bill really just addresses those exact concerns that you just laid out there. Was uh, Rather than um, requiring someone to try things that, I mean, sometimes they were requiring them to try things that they'd already tried, but just under a different insurance company and the doctor knew that this wasn't the successful thing. Um, so rather than making you try things because um, it's a policy of the insurance company, um, it would allow doctors to bypass some of that stuff and allow patients to work directly with their doctors to get the treatments or cares or whatever the case might be in those mostly prescription area. And um, so it was uh, one of those things that had uh, 
a lot of uh, support. Um, I'm pretty sure it was bri wide bipartisan support. Um, it was already Tuesday when, when we voted on that, and we've had a session on Thursday, so sometimes it's hard to keep all the votes straight, but when you meet <laughs> a couple times in a week like that, but um, I don't remember there being uh, any um, any real opposition to that uh, legislation. Does it go far enough? You said uh, bypasses some of that. Uh, it sh shouldn't it bypass all of it? Is there is there really, should you ever have an uh, insurance company playing doctor? Well, I think that, I mean, you have to have, you have to be, have some sort of standard for what's covered services. I mean, it's not, uh, I mean, if you were gonna have the concept of it being no regulation in that area could mean then that there were just no standard at all about um, what's covered and not covered or what's considered a covered service. And so I think that there's certainly roles that insurance companies play in the market and the ability for consumers to choose what kind of coverage they want and how much they want to pay for it. So I don't think it would be why. I mean, even in government-run health care like Medicare or, or the Medicaid programs, there's still covered services and not covered services and standards and things like that. So I don't think that that's generally unaccepted. I think it's better to take the approach like this bill did of, okay, we've got some pretty good examples here of where the regulations getting in the way. So let's bring forward a bill to move the regulation out of the way. And if there's other areas that can be well identified by um, interest groups and stuff, I think people would be open to those discussions. Uh, one of the bills that you authored uh, made their way through the uh, the assembly this week. Um, it's uh, directory data. It, it's it's kind of a complicated thing. It's confusing. Yeah. It, it is. A, is, a, is yeah. A, maybe I'll just let you frame the whole thing then your, yourself. I, we sure. have had a story on this. Uh, yes. You can go to dailydodge.com if you want to read something in writing. Yeah. Um, but uh, and based on your own words with yep. this, but uh, tell us about this directory data bill. No, and your your f um, story uh, several weeks ago, I think covered it well, both with what my explanation was, as well as I know you reached out to the superintendent at the Beaver Dam School District, and then he helped explain a little bit of what they were looking at there, too. And so if folks are interested, they should definitely check that out. And um, what it was about um, local officials and discussions on school safety um, brought forward a story of where they went to a school to um, contact a student who had had a tragedy in their family and wanted to uh, reach out to them and help them through that and the school said when the detective and the human services worker in questioned if the student and the parent if they had the right people matched up here they certainly didn't want to tell the wrong kid about a tragedy and the school said well technically we can't release who the child's parent is because that's not part of directory data that's allowed to be released by the school but they did work with them because they're like look you're trying to do the right thing here so We'll try to work with you, but technically this is a not part of the directory data. So they just said to me, you know, why is the parent's name not part of the directory data? I said, I have no idea, so let's look into it. And so we reached out to the school board association and, and talked to ledge council attorneys and stuff uh, and started to work on the bill. And um, the school board association said, we don't know why it's not included, but it's not listed in the statute. So what directory data is, is Specifically in the statute, it lists what's allowed to be released by school districts if certain rules are followed. And it's things like the child's name, the child's address, the child's phone number, the child's height and weight if they're in athletics. It's not the parent's name. That wasn't part of the list. No. All of this is public information right well, now. It is in the statutes allowed to be released under directory data. Then makes their own decision, their own board policy, their, if you will, um, as to what they will include in directory data. They cannot include anything that's not listed in that statute that I just, now I didn't list everything that was in the statute, but I listed the bulk of it. I can't remember all of it off the top of my head. But there's not a lot of things. And But there is the address and phone and name of the student is something that is listed. Already. Already, current law. But now school boards can say, we will include some of that, we will include all of that, we will include none of it. I think schools do different things based on what their school policy is. Then the other step is, and that's why I say those things can be released as long as rules are filed. So the first one is the school district sets a policy. The next one is every year when you sign your kid up for school, 
um, you fill out a lot of forms. One of them is your ability to opt out. School has set whatever they would release. I don't want my kids' information to be part of that. Mm -hmm. That's current law. None of this current law stuff do we change in any way in the bill. All the bill says is in that list that's in the statute that schools can consider if they want in or out of their directory data, we would add the parent's name, the legal guardian, parent or legal guardian, whatever the case is for the student. And um, that's why I thought it was a very reasonable thing. I didn't view it as a big privacy concern. All the current law safeguards are in place. That's also why the School Board Association and the School Superintendents Association said it's fine. We, we maintain all of our control. We can choose how and when and our board policies of how we would you know, utilize this or not utilize this. Um, it's all, you know, they were all fine with it. We weren't really expecting any challenges. We had Democratic co-sponsors. And um, then suddenly uh, Milwaukee Public Schools reached out to me and were very concerned that I was creating a what would be a public record that would be used for marketing against them by private schools in Milwaukee to try to get recruit students to come into the private school choice program in Milwaukee. And I just kind of dismissed it because I was like, well, yes, I guess technically we would make the parent's name available, but current law already makes the child's name and the child's address available. So if someone wants to market to a family, you already can. You can uh, you know, market to the, you know, if it was my family, the, the parents of, you know, so-and-so at that address, um, to the born family at that address. You know, I didn't really think that this was a major change um, in current law, but that's where the so-called privacy concerns came in then. They started lobbying that it was this big privacy concern. We weren't making any changes to the current um, system other than adding one name <laughs> that could be included with all of the other things that currently can be included. Um, so it became kind of a partisan thing then. I will say that we still it was a bipartisan bill because the Dem legislator, who's a retired teacher, um, came to me and said, you know, I'm not taking my name off the bill and I'm going to support it because I think it's a very reasonable thing that you're trying to do here and I don't have a problem with that. I certainly respect uh, Representative Verwink for that because um, I'm sure he got a lot of pressure when it became kind of a partisan issue down the road. Um, but uh, it was nice that he was able to see through that. And, um, you know, the bill moved forward in our house. I don't know what will happen to it in the Senate. We'll see if they move it forward. I, I I still don't see the controversy that folks have tried to make this out to be, but there are people that um, believe it's some sort of privacy concern. If if it is, then I don't know why they wouldn't be writing a bill to repeal the current law and take all that stuff away, because um, I don't see how adding the parent's name to what already exists for address and child's name and everything would really change those circumstances. But um, sometimes, and when we're in a hyper-partisan environment like this, um, things get exaggerated. Um, you know, I don't live in Milwaukee and know how contentious the Milwaukee public school, Milwaukee school choice thing is, obviously, from the way um, their lobbyist was so concerned about this bill. It must be uh, a major thing down there. But um, I still think that the request that was made by the local officials was reasonable. I think that adding the parent's name is not something that's unreasonable at all. In fact, I was stunned that the parent's name would not be tied to the child's name. Um, I just think it's weird. I think if my kid does something, my name, whether I like it or not, <laughs> is tied to it, you know? Um, well, it sounds like so, if you don't like it, you could opt out of it. Well, but you would opt out of all of the information, sure. including your kids. Right. So that's fine. I mean, then, but then your kid's information wouldn't be part of the directory data either. You know, you would just say, I don't want to be included. And that's, everyone's certainly fair to do that and sure. I think that this is something that doesn't usually get a lot of attention because it's not really used in marketing in sinister ways that the Milwaukee schools thought it was going to be used in their eyes it's more used for yearbooks and you know school phone books and things like that I mean we get in you know a directory of um, phone numbers and stuff from my daughter's school mm -hmm. so that we could contact families and things you know sure. everybody gets it and I don't think that generally folks are overly concerned about that um, I mean is it possible that any record could be used in some way sure I mean you think any, anyone who writes my office could have privacy concerns you write my office it's a public record someone could ask for that under open records and have your address 
or your phone number or whatever information you put in that. There isn't anything I can do about that. That's the open records law. Mm-hmm. That's just the way it is. So, um, yeah, some of these records do exist, and there are privacy concerns with them. I just don't think that um, the fact that we didn't change any of the current law and the current availability and simply added a parent's name really has any major impact one way or other on the privacy. If people are concerned about the privacy of directory data, that's more of a global concern about the statute that's existed. I don't know for how that's new. And, you know, if folks want to have a conversation about that, you know, we could probably have that, I guess. Uh, so that uh, is awaiting Senate action, potentially. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what, happen- uh, what happened with the dark store loophole legislation? Doesn't look like it's uh, it's going anywhere this um, there really hasn't been too much talk about it. The governor had it as a policy thing in his budget. We, of course, removed all the policy. That's how part of how you get a budget down to 500 pages. Um, I mean, I think there'll be some ongoing discussions on it. I will say that um, some of the most recent cases we've been seeing, um, the municipalities have been winning. Um, the last two that I've seen, at least that in, the, in the email updates, have been places where... Um, big box retailers had tried to make changes to their assessment and sued and the municipalities won. So I don't know if that's starting to change the dynamic at all in the conversation, that maybe this is something that's uh, losing or, or not really as big an issue as some were making it out to be, that you know the courts are starting to kind of level that playing field a little bit or if they're just a couple of anomalies and, and the next you know cases won't be like that I think we'll kind of wait and see but um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of more discussions on it the League of Municipalities is certainly uh, still making it their top priority yeah uh, is um, uh, should it play out in the courts I mean should municipalities have to spend money to defend something that, uh, that perhaps is is baseless and has been determined to be baseless in other courtrooms well, I think that's ultimately where, if if that's what the consistent rulings start to be, then yeah, they will be. Um, I mean, if you bring frivolous lawsuits, there's things that courts can do to, to punish um, bad actors for that, too, I mean, in, in any area, not just in this area. But I think that, um, you know, there's some confusion here, certainly, and um, but ultimately, if... Um, the city assessors are doing the right thing, then they should win in court and municipalities should win. And if they are over assessing, which were some of those early rulings that came in, then that's the wrong thing. They're not following state law and uh, businesses should have every right to point that out too. Um, but that's still also you know, not something that is, one, it might not need a state remedy and two, it might not be easy to fix. You know, the, what, the, what the League of Municipalities is asking us to do is redefine how property is assessed in the state of Wisconsin. We've talked about this before in right. some detail on the show. And you can't, under the Constitution's uniformity clause, you can't just pick winners and losers on that. Um, you can't just say that, you know, I'm only going to get big stores or if you change the way property is assessed, it has to be all property in that sector. So it would be all um, commercial business property. And that could have um, significant impact on, you know, small mom and pop shops and things like that. You know, you've got, um, I mean, we're seeing in some ways now with uh, a lot of people have been working pretty hard to revitalize downtown Beaverdam. We've got a couple of new uh, small businesses that have opened up. I saw one of them was uh, promoted on the front page of the pa- local paper today. Yeah. And, um, you know, if we change how businesses are assessed for property taxes, that will impact them as well. And so um, that's why it's been so tricky. And that's why I spent a fair amount of time explaining it to folks last summer on the campaign trail. We've talked about it, like I said before, on the radio here. and. Um, it's not just, uh, I know that uh, the league has been calling it a loophole, but really it's about whether or not things are assessed properly under current law or whether or not there be should be some sort of reform that would make those assessments differently. People need to recognize that that would mean a change to how all similar property is assessed, not just a Walgreens or a Walmart. Yeah, within the commercial sector, that wouldn't spill over into residential property. No, residential would probably still be different, um, but anything commercial, industrial, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, it's not just commercial, um, I don't believe. I think it would also include um, your small manufacturers and things like that that have 
uh, property that are assessed similarly. And so, you know, that's important. And also um, at a time where retailers are struggling, and I mean, you don't have to look any further than the empty Boston store and the empty in three or four days now Shopko store to see that this is a struggling um, and to say that we should um, pass a law that's being pushed right now by the league that redefines how we assess these properties. Um, you know, I'm not sure that that's the best public policy right now either. Um, and that might just help add to the challenges of uh, retail stores in our communities. Yeah, and I know we have talked about this in the past. I, I think we've in the past talked about how uh, some of these um, bigger box stores don't want to be assessed based on the contents of their of their store. Right. Which you made the analogy, you know, that I shouldn't be assessed for my TV and my sofa and everything right. like that. Uh, the other side of that, we, we haven't really gotten to this side too much, and I can't claim to be an expert on it, but as sure. I understand, um, some of these big box stores want to be assessed at what they think their property will be worth if they were to abandon that property yes. as opposed to what it's worth today. Yes. Do you think that's fair? No, that's one of that's the difference. There's two bills that were proposed last session. The one that you're referring to would be known as the dark store bill. Mm -hmm. That was a bill that I'd signed on to that I would be supportive of. I also think, though, that um, the industry and the assessors are moving away from that because I think they realize that that was one that wasn't That's what appropriate. you were saying before. Yeah. yeah. And so now it's more of the challenge of what was known as the Walgreens bill because that was the first lawsuit that it came out of. And that's the, is the property assessed on the true value of the land and the development that's on it? Or is it assessed on things like what they're doing there, um, uh, sales, uh, n net leases, if it's a lease property, um, because sometimes, a lot of times these companies will have a developer build the property and own it, and the company will lease it from them. I don't know why they do that. That's a business model thing. No idea. But then they try to assess them on the value of the lease as opposed to the value of the property. Well, the lease is higher because they're paying for both renting it and the construction cost. It's all built in together. And so when they're paying that premium for, basically the developer is like both the bank and the landlord. So the lease pays them back for the construction costs over time and pays them a rent. And it's a negotiated contract. And so, but that doesn't tell you what the true value of the building and the land is. That tells you what the value of the deal that they worked out on the construction of the property is. And so uh, when those type of things are being used to determine values, it can distort things. Um, because those payments aren't forever. Those payments are for the life of the contract, the, the deal that pays for the construction costs and the and then you know it might be a 10 or 20 year deal or something but at some point they're going to renegotiate that and change that um, that doesn't tell you what the value of the property is so and that's not what wisconsin law is wisconsin law doesn't say that you should look at side deals or what's going on in the property it says you should compare it to similar tax accordingly and so that's where the the challenge is and so if we start saying that you know, uh, we're going to look at what you're doing in the building or what your annual sales are or things like that. I mean, that can start impacting um, all businesses in a much different way. And even for a small business, like I used an example of the downtown, um, you know, your sales are a lot smaller than Walgreens, but proportion to your um, profits and the cost of running your business and things like that, it's all relative and so an assessment that goes up 10 percent 15 percent 20 percent because it figures other things into it is going to have a major impact on those small businesses um, in fact one could argue that some of the bigger ones would be more equipped to handle it better and it would be more devastating for small businesses who are operating at very small margins and so i have always been concerned with that I've been the mayor a number of times until we can figure out a way to address their concerns on the League of Municipalities side, 
without having to write a law that will have a negative, what I was concerned is a negative impact on businesses across the sector, not just certain ones, then I remain opposed to that. I remain, I mean, I'm not interested in finding a way to raise taxes on all businesses in, in Beaver Dam or anywhere else in the state. And, uh, you know, I'm open to suggestions. No one's brought forward a different draft of the bill. They've brought forward the same stuff they were trying to do last time, which will, I'm, I'm afraid, have a negative impact on all sectors in, in Wisconsin. So, All right. I uh, just have a few minutes left here. Again, uh, circling back to the uh, the budget, uh, fairly confident that it'll make it through the uh, uh, both houses of the legislature next week. Uh, as you said earlier, uh, what do you think our chances of the governor signing what comes through those houses are? Um, I'm hopeful. I mean, I think like we talked about at the beginning, you know, this is an attempt to be a compromise really without a willingness to negotiate from the East Wing. And so we uh, invested in a lot of areas that were a priority to him too. Um, invested in, as I said, like in education, exactly the same amount per pupil, uh, things like that. We found ways to bring new revenue into the roads uh, discussion, and uh, certainly he has the most powerful line item veto pen in the country, and, and he'll, I'm sure, find ways to uh, craft it more to his liking and carve it up, probably from our perspective, but uh, hopefully he'll sign it and we'll have a a budget that you know invests in priorities in Wisconsin for the next two years. Are we going to see uh, any uh, Mark Bourne authored bills coming up in the legislature that we haven't talked about yet? Um, I'm still working on the protective status for jailers bill, and so we'll, we'll continue to try to move that forward. I th um, I think we're going to dive in this summer and fall into some reforms in the Chapter 51, which uh, which is commitments, uh, mental health commitments. There's a lot of issues there working with local officials in Beaver Dam and Dodge County and as well as interest groups in the Department of Justice. So it's a really complex issue. Whole um, show probably could be done. Yeah, and that's why and I don't even have enough to talk about it yet because that's why when you when you asked that question, I was kind of like, yes, we will work on things, but I've been so deep into the state budget right. for the last couple of months that we really haven't right. worked on anything else. Yeah, It's yeah. just, I mean, that's a really deep, comprehensive But that's on your job. radar, that uh, yes. Chapter 51 stuff. That hasn't really been resolved. There's been a few, uh, you know, attempts and a few things yeah. have gone through, but um, it, there's still a lot there, it seems It's like. a challenging area, but I've got a good staffer. She's really interested in the topic, yeah. too, and uh, we began working on it last summer a little bit. Uh, not in real in-depth, because obviously I was on the campaign trail, and that takes away from some of that work. But, um, yeah, I started working on it last summer with uh, the Department of Justice. Then, obviously, there's a new attorney general now, but when I met with him, uh, a few weeks ago, or I guess maybe a couple months ago now on budget issues, I brought it up to him. He said he was interested in working on it also, so I think we're going to uh, try to work with him and, and uh, a lot of stakeholder groups on it, and we'll see where it comes out. Right. Well, we'll be looking forward to getting updates here in uh, future programs. In the meantime, I want to thank you very much for joining us on the program, and uh, thank you for uh, contributing to the uh, WBEV WXRO Radiothon with your, uh, with your participation in the Angel Walk yesterday. Yeah, always happy to do that. I think uh, we've made most of them. We've maybe been traveling for one or two of the, uh, what, 11, I think, uh, Angel That was number now. 11, yeah. yeah. And uh, great, uh, you know, great uh, program put together there by the Smith family. It's really nice that uh, they're able to participate uh, and help with the Children's Radiothon, which, of course, I mean, kudos to the station and everyone here in the Good Karma Brands. Is that the name of the company that, now? That's what, good, good Karma Brands now. Family that works on that uh, important uh, project for the area that invests in a lot of great programs. And so, yeah, we were thrilled to, again, be able to be a small part of it with a good walk. And I'll tell you, uh, for a guy that's been sitting around on b budget <laughs> stuff, a two-and-a-half-mile walk was a little bit of a stretch. It, it is. You have yeah. to stretch first. Maybe yeah. that's the trick. I probably will do that next year. Good <laughs> tip. Right, very good. In uh, the meantime, I want to thank you for joining us on the program today. Uh, State Representative Mark Bourne of Beaver Dam, that's going to do it for today's community comment. Just four spots remaining for the WBV, WXRO, and travel leaders adventure in Ireland. Eight sensational days in September of this year. This is a totally customized tour. So whether you've been there before or if this